to just since uh, Gage is uh, leaving us a little bit earlier, or, not, or leaving us at, I guess, um, at 2 p.m. sharp. So um, just to make sure that we are all um, able to ask her the questions that we, we, we may want. So um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Uh, our guest speaker is uh, Gage Martin from Boston College, and she'll be telling, about, telling us about Kavad homology in link detection. Um, so yeah, please Gage, go ahead. Hi, um, just before I get started, I would really like to thank the organizers of this learning seminar for the um, invitation to speak to you all today. Um, and also before we get started, I just feel it's important for me to say that I'm speaking to you all from the stolen territory of the Massachusetts people. Um, and it's just a I think a good thing to say to think about the continuing history of colonialism and genocide in the United States. Um, so with that being said, I'll start telling you about some of this math. So I'm a low dimensional topologist. Um, and so I will spend the first part of my, and I study links specifically using categorified invariants. Um, so I'll spend the first part of my talk just um, kind of establishing the sorts of topological questions I might want to ask and try to answer with a categorified invariant like Kavanaugh homology. And then after that, we can go it, we'll talk more about like, how do you answer that type of question with Kavanaugh homology? So the first part will just be very topological and probably some really basic background for a lot of you. Um, so the topological objects I like to study are called our links. Um, here are some pictures of links. Um, I think a picture is a much better definition than like a formal mathematical definition. Um, and so there's a very special link. It's a very simple link called the unknot as an example. And so I think as a low dimensional topologist, a very basic question you might want to ask about knots and links are, could you decide on some algorithm? So you take a picture like we saw before and decide if that picture is really a picture of this really simple link, not the unknot. Um, I should say that I think this question was first answered in the 60s by Hawken. Um, but most of the algorithms, uh, his algorithm and most of the ones since until these categorified invariants were are very, very slow and hard even for a computer to do. Um, and so looking at our first examples, you might think that this is a pretty easy question. Um, obviously this knot here on the top left is an unknot. Um, and if you, you, obviously this knot down here on the bottom right is also an unknot. Um, and obviously this one here, you have two different circles, so it's not an unknot. And um, you would probably believe that this one's not an unknot, and it's not too hard for um, you to prove that if you maybe, um, you know, have read the chapter on the fundamental group in Hatcher or something like that. Um, and there's plenty of ways you could show that this picture is not an unknot. So, at first, this might feel like a really easy question. So maybe just to convince you all that this isn't like a trivial question, um, let's look at some more pictures. So here's some pictures of some knots. Um, and well, we might ask which of these pictures are a knot. Um, and so at least to me, it's not entirely obvious that this picture on the left and this picture on the far right are really pictures of unknots, but, but they are. And so this is just maybe an example of how this question isn't a trivial question. Um, and maybe I should say these two pictures in the middle are not unknots. So this sort of question of can you take a picture and decide if it's an unknot or something like that is the sort of topological question I want to be thinking about during this talk. Um, so now I can tell you about the tool that I would like to use to study these talks. Um, many of you will 
be familiar with it. It's called Kovanov homology. Um, and so it's an invariant of a link defined by Kovanov. And what does this invariant look like? If you start with a link L, you should get some bigraded abelian group um, called the Kovanov homology of L. Um, and this bigraded abelian group is coming as the homology of some chain complex. Um, and this is a categorified invariant. Specifically, it's a categorification of the Jones polynomial. Um, and to a low dimensional topologist, that really means two things. So the first would be if you take the graded Euler characteristic of the quantum homology, you should recover the Jones polynomial. And the second is if you have a cobordism um, between two links, so that's a surface that um, has a boundary of one link on the one side and the other link on the other side, then that should induce a map between their Kavanaugh homologies. Um, and I think a final good point to know about Kavanaugh homology is much like the Jones polynomial, there's a combinatorial definition of it. So there's um, just to some basic rules you could follow to take a picture of your knot or link and construct this chain a chain complex whose homology is the Kavanaugh homology of your link. Um, and it's relatively straightforward to follow these rules. Um, within a few hours, you could be teaching some undergraduate who knows some linear algebra how to compute a simple example. Um, and computers are, are very, very good at computing Kavanaugh homology. Um, they can do so relatively quickly. So it's um, easy or relatively easy to give a computer a picture of a knot and ask the computer what the Kavanaugh homology of that knot is. Um, so I think as a low dimensional topologist, if you're given like a algebraic or categorified invariant like that, like this, I think a natural question is like, well, what sort of information should I be thinking about when I think about this invariant? What is it really telling me about the topological objects that I'm looking at? And so just to give you an example of what an answer to this question might be, um, maybe the first categorified invariant anyone um, most of us would be familiar with it from algebraic topology is singular homology. And so a rough answer to this is that singular homology is telling us about like holes in spaces. Um, Hagard floor homology and related invariants like not floor homology can tell you a lot of top topological information. And in particular, they can tell you about embedded surfaces. Um, on the other hand, in general, not much is actually known about what sort of topological information is contained in Kavanaugh homology, which um, as a low dimensional topologist is both an unsatisfying answer um, because it would be nice to have that answer and then also exciting because it would be nice to be able to try and answer this question in some small cases or some, in some examples. Um, so I guess with that, that idea of wanting to know about topological information of quantum homology, maybe let's go back to this question about can we detect an unknot? Um, given some picture, it, can we tell if this picture is an unknot? So, like I said, if we have a picture of a knot, we can ask a computer to compute the quantum homology of that knot. So maybe I take my picture and I ask the computer to compute its quantum homology. So one thing that's obvious is if I compute its Kavanaugh homology and it's not the same as the Kavanaugh homology of the unknot, then my picture is definitely not the unknot. Um, but a more interesting question is, well, what if I computed the Kavanaugh homology and it is the same as the unknot? What, what could I say about my knot K? Um, and this is really a specific example of this question of what sort of topological information is contained in the Kavanaugh homology of a knot or link. Um, so we wouldn't have to just focus on the unknot. We could more generally fix some simple link, L0. And we might ask, well, if the Kavanaugh homology of some link L is the same as my simple link L0, then 
are L and L0 the same length? Um, and so if this is true, we'd say that Kavana homology detects the link L0. Um, and so maybe just to say a few things. The first is, um, if you know Kavana homology detects some link L0, this gives you a relatively quick way of deciding if a picture of a knot or link is that, that special link um, just by computing its Kavana homology. Um, I believe this is the fastest way to take a picture of a knot and decide if it's an unknot. Um, at least one of the fastest ways currently. Um, and I should say that there are definitely examples of two different links with the same Kavana homology. So we couldn't ask for this detection result to be true for every link. And so that's why I say we should maybe focus on simple links first. Um, because we know for complicated enough links that this isn't true. Um, so I'm about to just show you some links that Kavana homology is known to detect. But before I do that, like, are there any questions about the sorts of questions I want to ask about using Kavana homology? OK, so like I said, um, with this background, we might want to ask, well, what, what links or does Kavana homology detect? And so the first thing that Kavana homology detects is the unknot. Um, this was shown by Kronheimer and Rufka. Um, and this is pretty great, because if Kavana homology didn't detect the unknot, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to detect anything else either. Um, I guess I should also say that prior to this Kronheimer and Rucka result, um, it was shown that the categorification of the colored Jones polynomial detected the unknot um, by Grigsby and Verley. And um, it was also shown that Kavana homology of cables detected the unknot by um, Hedden as well. Um, so then the next link that was known to be detected by the by Kavana homology is the unlink. So that would be taking unknots and putting them next to each other. And so this was done by Head and Knee and extended by Batson and Sieb. Um, and I guess I should also say more recently, Lipschitz and Sarkar have used the same ideas in the detection result for the unlink to show that Kavana homology can determine if a link is a split link or not. So that would be um, some extension of this result that was done by um, Lipschitz and Sarkar. Um, since then, Baldwin and Sivak showed that Kavana homology detects the trefoil. Um, and then they, along with Xi, showed that Kavana homology detects the hop link. Um, and then Ji and Jang showed that quantum homology detects the connected sum of two hop links and the torus link T24. And then I showed that quantum homology detects the torus link T26. And so later in this talk, we'll see an outline of the proof that quantum homology detects the torus link T26. So we can understand how to prove a detection result like this. Um, Ji and Jang then showed that Kavana homology detects the link L6N1. And together with Li, they showed that Kavana homology detects the link L7N1. And um, now there's another, um, and also the connected sum of the trefoil and the hop link. And now there's actually a third knot that's known to be detected by Kavana homology. So um, the figure eight knot is detected by Kavana homology, and this is due to Baldwin, Dallin, Levine, Lindman, and Sazdanovic. Um, and this is very recent work. Um, and so you might have noticed that before all the links were built out of unknots and trefoils. And so now that this result exists, you might ask, well, what about links you build that have figure eight components as well? Um, 
So, like I said, we'll see a sketch of the proof that Kavana homology detects the torus link T26. And before we do that, um, we'll talk about just like what tools might you use if you had your favorite link and you wanted to know if Kavana homology detected that link. Um, and then this sketch of a proof, we'll see how we could put those tools together to prove a detection result. So before I get into the tools too much, um, all of these tools are come in the form of a spectral sequence. And so I just want to say a word or two about that. Um, so we might ask, well, if we have these two homology theories associated to a link, maybe we call them A of L and B of L, what does it mean to say there's a spectral sequence from A of L to B of L? And so maybe a formal definition would be you can make A of L into some chain complex with some differential on it. And we don't really care that much what the differential is, but we want that the homology of this chain complex is this other theory B of L. Um, but really for all of our applications, what we really need is we get some rank inequality where the rank of A of L has to be at least as large as the rank of B of L. Um, just because when we take homology, our rank might shrink, but it certainly won't um, grow larger. So um, these tools, these spectral sequences really come in two different sorts of camps. So the first would be these spectral sequences that are somehow internal to the theory of Kavana homology. Um, so the first example of that is this link splitting spectral sequence um, constructed by Batson and C. And so this is a spectral sequence from the Kavana homology of your link to the tensor product of the Kavana homologies of the components of your link, the, the knots that make up your link. And this is called um, a link splitting spectral sequence because this tensor product is also the Kavana homology of the split link built from those components. So it's like you've taken your link and pulled all of the components apart from each other. Um, so how this is then used is to identify when a component of your link, one of those knots, is an unknot or a trefoil. And with a little bit more care, you can also use this spectral sequence to determine the linking numbers between components as well. Um, and so the other tool that's somehow internal to Kavana homology is this spectral sequence to Lie homology. And so Lie homology is some very, um, is a theory that's some deformation of Kavana homology and its total rank of its homology is always just two to the number of components of your link. So this could be used to help you know how many components of your link you have and also the homological grading on Lie homology also lets you see the linking number between components. Um, so there's two different ways to see linking numbers, but um, so far the information that we've said these tools can see is relatively basic information about our link. So we can tell maybe what the components of our link are, we can tell what the linking number between the components is, but if we wanted to show some detection result, we need to have more information about our link. Um, and so in all of the applications to link detection so far, this extra information comes in the form of a spectral sequence to some floor theory. Um, so these really are, um, come in two different types and are used in two different ways. So the first is the Azrath-Szabo spectral sequence to the Haggard floor homology of the branch double cover of your link. So this is used to detect, has been used to detect splitting spheres in the link complement. Um, so that means when your link is like a split link with components that are separate from each other. Um, so this was used maybe to detect the unlink 
or to show quantum homology can tell when a link is split. Um, and alternatively, these splitting spheres are S1 cross S2 summands in the branch double cover of your link. Um, and that's really what the Haygarden floor homology is detecting. Um, the other spectral sequences, there's two of them, but I list them together because in many formal ways, they're similar, and the ways that they're used are similar. So there's the Kronheimer Murfka spectral sequence to I natural of L, which is some invariant of your link to defined using instanton floor homology. And um, there's also the Dallin spectral sequence to the not floor homology of your link. Um, and so both of these can be used to understand um, surfaces that your knots bound um, and how those surfaces interact with the rest of your link. And so that should be lots of topological information that lets you detect your link. In particular, both link floor homology and some variant of I natural of L um, can detect braid closures in the complement of an unknot. Um, and so I'll actually, on the next few slides, sketch a proof that link floor homology detects um, braid closures. But before I do, are there questions um, about any of these tools? We'll get to see how to use all these tools, some of these tools to prove quantum homology detects the torus link T26 in a little bit. Okay, so then if there aren't tool, um, any questions, maybe we can look briefly at, well, why does link floor homology detect braid closures? And I know that um, this isn't necessarily a seminar where link floor homology and floor homologies are talked about tons. So I'm not including this hoping to convey every detail. I just think I want the takeaway from this part just to be like some feeling for why you can prove all these topological applications of not floor homology or link floor homology, but it's maybe harder to prove some of these applications directly in the theory of Kavana homology without some sort of relationship to a floor theory. Um, and like what sorts of things are you allowed to do in, a, in these floor theory theoretic settings? So it turns out that um, the link floor homology of your link is also what's called the sutured floor homology of the link complement if you give the link complement the appropriate sutures. Um, and so here we can see we have our unknotted component um, and it's bounding this red disk and we have our other component of the link and maybe it intersects this red disk three times as an example. And so what's nice about being able to frame link floor homology as the floor homology of this link complement is the floor homology of this link complement behaves well under certain operations. So in particular, we understand how it behaves under the operation where we cut along this disk and get some manifold that looks like the one on the right where something's happening in the middle and we're not really sure what it is. And so this is called decomposing our manifold. Um, and what's happening here is that the, the floor homology of this cut open manifold corresponds to the link floor homology of this manifold specifically in like the top Alexander grading associated to the unknot. Um, so really the bottom Alexander grading associated to the unknot, but there's um, some symmetry going on. So it's not really that important. Um, and this is something you can do in these floor theories because they're sitting inside of these larger package of invariants for three manifolds. And this isn't really something we could do necessarily for Kavana homology. Um, as at least as far as I know, um, there's not really a known relationship between the Kabanov homology of this two component link here 
and some Kavana homology of this tangle here. Um, and so this is like an argument you can make in the floor setting that you maybe can't make right now in the quantum setting. Um, and so then kind of um, this part is a little bit more technical. You have some extra sutures here um, that you can remove. And what that does is that double or halves the rank of your floor homology. Um, and then the last point is that if your link was a braid closure, then this part in the middle, it would just be like some braid. Um, and in particular, this whole manifold would look like a product. It would look like um, this punctured surface cross I. And it turns out that this manifold looks like a product if and only if its floor homology has rank one which would mean that that's if and only if this floor homology was rank two. And so going back, that would mean that's if and only if the link floor homology is rank two in this top Alexander grading. And so the rank of the link floor homology in this top Alexander grading detects if your um, link is like an unknot with some braid closure. Um, and like I said, we won't use all the details of this argument later, but um, I just wanted to include it just to give like an idea of what sorts of arguments can be made in a floor setting that so far can't be made directly in a quantum setting. And so um, now that we've seen some of these tools, maybe we can see how to put all those tools together to prove a link detection result. Um, and we'll look at this example that I did, where I showed that Kavana homology detects the torus link T26. Um, and so when we're covering this framework, uh, as a warm up, we'll first use the framework to show that Kavana homology detects the Hopf link. And why we're doing that is it's simpler, but every step we do is going to be mirrored by a step in the proof that Kavana homology detects T26. Um, and just as a reminder, Hoplink, the detection was originally proved by Baldwin, Sivak, and G, and they used a, a different argument than what I'll be presenting here. Um, but I'm presenting this argument because it extends to show Kavana homology detects T26. So first, as let's see a rough outline of our proof, and then we can see some more details. So if we assume that our link L and the Hopf link have the same Kavanaugh homology, the first thing we might show is that L has two components and that the linky number between the components is one. Um, but so here's a link that's not the Hopf link, where you have two components and the linky number is one. So we'd want to make sure that our link L doesn't look like this. And so, well, here what we could do is we could show that each of our components is an unknot. And so this link, one of the components is not an unknot. So we know that L is not this link, but maybe L is this link where the linky number is one and both components are unknots, but it's still not the hop link. And so to rule that out, what we can do is show that one component is a braid in the complement of the other. Um, and so then this is now the only link with two unknotted components and linking number one, where one of the components is a braid in the complement of the other. And so, so that means that our link L is this hop link. And so we've just shown Kavana homology detects the hop link. So maybe we can now see in a little bit more detail, how do we do each of those steps? Um, but maybe before we go into more details, are there questions about this outline of a proof? Yeah, I mean, so your spectral sequence, are you still considering one and it's going to where now? And where are you using this? In which, oh. which? Um, so I, I'm going to show how, how we do each of these steps with spectral sequences in just a second. Um, but that's a really great question. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any question about like, 
if we show each of these steps, how do we know we've detected the hop link or something like that? But that's a, a really great question and I'll get to it in just a second. Um, and if I don't answer your question when I try to get to it, please ask me again. Um, so maybe let's look at what spectral sequences we're using. So as a reminder, we have our spectral sequence to Lee homology. Um, and we know that Lee homology is ranked two to the number of components. And there's always pairs of generators in the same homological grading. And if you have a two component link, the difference in homological gradings is, is twice the linking number of your components. So this is the quantum homology of the hop link. So it has rank two and homological grading zero and rank two and homological grading two. And so this is enough to tell us that our link L has two components um, because the Lee homology can't have rank greater than four. And the linking number between these components is one because our pairs of generators are separated by um, I grading two, which is twice the linking number. Um, so this is our first spectral sequence that we're using. So now our step, second step was showing that our components are unknot. So here we'll use our link splitting spectral sequence. So remember, this is a spectral sequence from the quantum homology of L to the quantum homology of the split link made up of those components of L. And maybe something that's good to know is that for any knot, the rank of quantum homology is at least two. And Kronheim and Murfka showed that the only knot where the rank of quantum homology is two is the unknot. So now again, this is the quantum homology of our hop link. So then we know that if we multiply the ranks of the quantum homologies of the components, which would be the same as the rank of the tensor product of their quantum homologies, that's no bigger than the rank of this quantum homology of the link which is only rank four. So that tells us that both of our, both of our um, knots have quantum homology rank two, and so they're both unknots. Um, so now we know we have a link where both of the components are unknots, and we know the linking number. So we wanted to show that, um, that one of the unknots is a braid in the complement of the other. And so here we're going to use the Dallin spectral sequence um, to knot fuller homology. And the rank inequality it gives us tells us that the knot fuller homology or the link fuller homology of L has rank four, um, just because our Kavana homology had rank four. Um, and so then Again, this isn't really um, a talk about link floor homology. So I'll just say from properties of link floor homology, you're able to deduce that actually not only is it rank four, but it's as it carries these two Alexander gradings. And in these different Alexander gradings, it's rank one in these four bi gradings and rank zero everywhere else. Um, and so from here, because we know link floor homology detects braid closures um, for a two component link, one of the components is a braid in the complement of the other, if and only if this top Alexander grading is rank two. So this tells us that our, our link is a braid closure. And so that means that our link is the hop link, like we saw in our, our sketch of the proof. Um, so now after this, we'll like see how to do these same sorts of steps to prove quantum homology detects the torus link 226. But I wanted to pause again to see if, if I answered your question about what spectral sequences we were using and also if there are any other questions um, about this proof. Yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, Gage, there's a question in the chat from Eugene Gorski. Oh, okay. Um, 
or he's asking if for the last step you can also use the Thurston polytope. Yeah, that's a um, a great question. So I think that the the short answer it's the the answer is it's related to using the Thurston polytope, but I don't think it's quite the same. Um, so the Thurst the Thurston polytope would tell you for certainly that you have your, um, and maybe in this case it's equivalent. Um, the Thurston polytope would tell you that you have um, your unknot bounds of disk that intersects the rest of the link, in, in this case in one point. But um, in general, it's not really clear from the Thurston polytope if if that disk intersecting in one point really fibers the complement of the link um, in the same sort of way that not floor homology top Alexander grading detects genus um, by itself. And that's like the analog of the Thurston polytope. But the property I'm using here is maybe more of an analog that not floor homology in its top Alexander grading is rank one, if and only if it's a fibered knot. Um, and so that's like a little bit stronger than just detecting the genus. Um, I think maybe in this case, because bounding a disk that intersects once would tell you that um, it's like a connect sum with a hop link might be enough, but in general, it's a little bit stronger than the first in polytope. Um, so there's also another question in the chat that mentions that braid closures are also detected by annual quantum homology, which is true, um, and it's a great fact. And so then the question is, could we use that here to detect that our link is a braid closure? And I think that's a great question. I think, unfortunately, the answer is no, because um, even though we know that, the, that our link has this unknotted component, there's not necessarily a known relationship between the Kavana homology of this link and the annular Kavanagh homology of like the link minus this one unknotted component in, in the complement of the unknot. Um, I think there's maybe some conjectural relationships, but there's certainly nothing known as a relationship between those two theories. Um, but that is a great question because it is very natural to maybe want to use annular Kavanagh homology and avoid using a floor theory if you're trying to show something like this. Um, Though I guess I should say some of these, we've been secretly using floor theories at, at previous steps where we've used like the fact that Kavanagh homology detects the unknot. But yeah, that was a great question. Um, are there any other questions before I go and talk about um, how these steps work in the case of T26? Okay, so then if there aren't more questions. Uh, like I said, we can see how this, these same steps work in the case where instead we're showing that Kavanaugh homology detects T26 like I did. So as a sketch of our proof, um, again, we first would use our spectral sequence to Lee homology to see that L has two components and that the linking number between these components is three. And this step is really almost exactly the same as what we just saw. Um, maybe there's like a little bit more argument, but it's really still very straightforward to see that L has two components and that their linking number is three. Um, and again, well, here's some link that isn't T26 with two components and linking number three. Um, so we wanna rule this link out as a possibility for our link L. And so again, we'd use our link splitting spectral sequence to see that both components are unknots. Um, and this is a little bit more complicated than in the case of the hop link because our Kamana homology has a larger rank. So we actually need to use the fact that Kavanaugh homology detects the trefoil as well and then rule out the possibility that um, one of the components is a trefoil. Um, but again, here's a link with two unknotted components where the linking number is three, um, and it's not T26. So we wanna make sure our link doesn't look like this. And so again, we would use the Dowland spectral sequence to show that one unknot is a braid in the complement of the other. And um, here, 
the arguments are um, a little bit more involved than the arguments in the case of T2 2 in the case of the hop link because basically because you're not your Kavanaugh homology and therefore your not Fuller homology are much larger and so the arguments are just more involved. Um, and so now that you've done this, these are actually a, a complete list of links with two unknotted components, linking number three, and where one of the components is a braid and the complement of the other. And so here, now you have like some finite list. So you could just give all these pictures to your computer and ask it to compute the Kamana homology of each one. And so you check that the only links in this list with the same Kavanaugh homology as T26 is T26. And so the other ones have different Kavanaugh homologies. And so then you've shown that Kavanaugh homology detects the link T26. Um, and so that's everything that I wanted to tell you all during this talk. So I just wanted to thank you for um, your attention and for listening and asking such great questions. Awesome. Thank you, Gage. Uh -huh. Yeah, does anyone have any further questions for our speaker today? So, so what is the conjectural relationship between Havana homology and annular Havana homology? Yeah, well, so, um, I guess, first of all, I should say that there is a known relationship between annular Kavanaugh homology and just the Kavanaugh homology of that same link with the annulus just standardly embedded in S3. And so there's known to be a spectral sequence from the annular Kavanaugh homology to the Kavanaugh homology of this link. Um, I think some people believe, and I, I believe some people are working on, um, though I don't know exactly how much progress they've made, that there should also be some sort of spectral sequence between the annular Kavana homology of some link and the Kavana homology of that link L unioned with like the um, annular axis. Um, but again, I, that as far as I know, um, people haven't proven that yet. And still in our application, it probably wouldn't um, be quite enough because we, in your applications for Kavanaugh homology detecting something, you really want spectral sequences from Kavanaugh homology to some other theory to get the rank inequality working in the right, right way. And it's less useful to have a spectral sequence from some other theory to Kavanaugh homology, um, just if you sit down and work with inequalities. Um, it's, yeah, it's less helpful to have a lower bound on the rank of a homology theory than, the, than an upper bound on the rank, generally speaking, for these sorts of applications. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So what about T22N for general N? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question and it's a very natural question. So. Um, Maybe one thing I should point out is, so here, um, when I said that this is some finite list of possible links that are two unknotted components in linking number one, secretly, like what I'm using is that there's only three braid representatives of the unknot um, with braid index three up to conjugation. Um, and, and they're the ones pictured here, but, um, for four braids, there's actually infinitely many four braids that have a, a knot as their closure. So this step wouldn't get you down to a finite list, um, even if it was possible to do the rest of the argument. So um, it certainly isn't. But if you know the, I mean, if you already computed HFL head, I think you can, <coughs> I mean, my understanding is that you can do what you explained just before, that it's fibered and you know, you know, the Thurston polytope, it's like on a line. Yeah, um, that's a, a good- So in this case, you can actually compute the Darwin spectral sequence completely? 
Well, so um, I guess first of all, I should say really like the the Dahlin spectral sequence. Um, mostly, it for the this example, it's just collapsing, but it's going to like a delta graded version of not blur homology, and so roughly speaking, what I proved here was that like um, delta graded not floor homology with like some extra information detected T26. Um, but in proving this, um, I never actually computed the full link floor homology um, until I already concluded that it was T26. I just um, was only like, there was some case, some casework and basically lots of those cases either weren't possible or the cases that were possible all showed that you have a braid, but they didn't all necessarily look like the link floor homology of T26. Mm -hmm. So um, like those are only then ruled out once you show that like actually your link was T26. I see. Um, so you don't know a priori for that it's fibered or anything? Well, I have to think a little bit more about fiberness in particular, but um, maybe like one property of T26 is that for each component of it, the other component is a braid. Um, and that's something that isn't true for like every braid um, with an unknotted axis. Um, and so that's like something extra special. And that property for like T2, 2N is true. And there's only finitely many links that have that property, but that's like a stronger property and not something I was able to show so far with mm -hmm. this Allen spectral sequence. Um, but if you could like show that your links have this stronger property, then you might be able to show something again because you would get down to some finite list. Um, mm -hmm. There's maybe some other things you could try. I was just trying to say it's not, um, you can't just take this same argument and apply it in a straightforward way. Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah. Great, um, any, any more questions from anyone? All right. Um, in that case, since there seem to be no more questions, let's thank Gage once more. Um, thank you, Gage, for a really, really great talk. Um, and yeah, um, next week, uh, hopefully we'll see everyone here again. Uh, the slides and the video of the talk will be online. So if you want to go back and watch something or you came in late, um, you know, it'll all be online for you. So great. All right, see you guys next week. Thanks, Gage. Thank you.